Welcome to AP Chemistry and General Chemistry. I'm Jeremy Krug. In this lesson, we're learning about electrochemistry and galvanic cells. My channel has the entire AP Chemistry course, so don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I don't want you to miss a thing. Now, in this video, we're going to take a look at what electrochemistry is. It's basically the practical application of redox reactions. Now, if you have forgotten about redox reactions, you might want to take a look at lesson 12 in my series. But let's review just very briefly. Let's say that we have a piece of iron that's added to a solution of copper to sulfate. Well, if you look at that reaction, I hope that you realize that sulfate would be the spectator ion. Because normally in a redox reaction, most commonly what's happening is a metal is reacting with a metal ion. You know, that's what usually is happening. So that means the sulfate here would have to be considered as the uh, spectator ion. And so what will be reacting would be the iron and the copper two ion. So we're going to have to add these together. And so hopefully you realize that uh, iron would be oxidized into the most common form of iron in solution, which is probably going to be iron two. And then the copper two ions are going to be reduced down into just plain old copper metal like this. So Cu will be a product. Now we have to balance each of the half reactions. So in the first one here, we need two electrons on the right side to make that balance out in its charge. And then in the second one, we're going to need two electrons on the left side here to balance those out. So now when we take a look at this, we see that the first one is the oxidation. You know, losing electrons is oxidation. And then in the second one, that's reduction because gaining electrons means reduction. And now we can add these two half reactions together and the electrons will cancel out as those two electrons are transferred. And we end up with this as the overall balanced equation. So we wrote lots and lots of these redox reactions back in lesson 12. Once again, if this is completely foreign to you or you don't understand what this is, what this is then take a look at lesson 12 and those uh, in that video series. Now, let's take a look at this reaction close up. So let's imagine that we have a beaker here and there's actually a chunk of iron metal in here. So we actually have uh, these iron atoms, and that's what the Fe with the, with the dark circle around it is. We have the iron atoms, and that's in the solid state. And then we have these copper two ions that are swimming around in solution. Those will usually be blue, so I have those colored in blue. Well, we know that each one of these iron atoms would be a little bit more stable if it could lose a couple of electrons. And likewise, you know, these copper two ions, they're fairly stable, but they'd be a little bit more stable around iron if they could steal a couple of electrons from the iron atoms. So uh, guess what happens? This is what happens. Basically, the copper ions, or at least some of the copper ions, are going to steal electrons, you know, two electrons from the iron atoms. And guess what? Since this copper here that I'm pointing at just stole two electrons, it's now imprisoned in the solid state. So it is stuck in the solid state. Likewise, since the iron atoms donated electrons, well, now it gets to be free in the aqueous state. And this is basically just a, maybe an oversimplification of what's happening in that last reaction. Iron is easily oxidized, and so it gets to be uh, turned into that aqueous form there at least it's more easily oxidized when there are copper two ions around it. And copper two ions get to be reduced fairly easily, at least when there are iron atoms nearby. So this is what a redox reaction is. Now, the tendency of these particles to transfer electrons is very great. And what we can do is actually take these two solutions and these two elements and hook them up into this apparatus here, which we call a, a galvanic cell, which is basically just a battery. And we can use this battery to push electrons through a wire and actually get some useful work, get some useful electricity out of this redox reaction. So this is a, a setup of a battery for all practical purposes. In chemistry, we usually call it a galvanic cell. And so what's happening here? Well, 
the electrons are passing through the wire. And so we know that one side, you know, lost two electrons, one side gained two electrons. Well, those electrons are passing through the wire right here and through some, maybe a voltmeter or some kind of a light bulb or a radio or something. And it's being able to power some kind of a load. And this is where we actually use chemicals to carry out some very useful work, some electrical work here. We're actually able to, uh, to power something. Now, let's take a look at this galvanic cell and label the parts and actually see what's happening here. Now, we said earlier that with the iron, this is the half reaction that's taking place. The iron is turning into iron two ions and it's losing two electrons. So that's the the half reaction that's taking place right there. On the other side of the galvanic cell, we said that the copper two ions are gaining those two electrons that are being lost on this side, and it's turning into copper metal. So those are the two half reactions that we just uh, looked at in the previous example. Now, every one of these half reactions that we talk about has what we call a potential difference associated with it, or as a lot of people like to call it, a voltage. And it's there's nothing wrong with calling it voltage, potential difference. They're the same thing. Some people try to get stuck in the difference, but they're basically the same thing. You can call it potential difference or voltage. It's fine. So the iron changing to iron 2 and 2 electrons, half reaction, has a potential difference of positive 0 0.44 volts associated with it. And then this half reaction over here has a, ha has a voltage or a potential difference of positive 0.34 volts associated with it. And so guess what? To find the potential difference of the total battery of this entire galvanic cell, we just add those together. So when you add them together, you'll find that the voltage or the potential difference that's coursing through the wire here is 0.78 volts. And so if you have a voltmeter, maybe a digital voltmeter or even an analog one, it's going to light up with the voltage. It should say 0.78 volts if everything is done correctly, assuming we're at standard conditions, you know, one molar concentration for everything and 25 degrees Celsius and, and so forth. That's going to be the potential difference, 0.78 volts. Now, we said that this half reaction over here is oxidation. Now, when you have oxidation, in chemistry, we say that this, this side of the galvanic cell, if there's oxidation taking place there, that's called the anode. And so oxidation takes place at the anode. Now over here, we have reduction. And reduction, well this piece of metal right here, since there's reduction taking place there, we call that the cathode. That's just how it works. Oxidation always takes place at the anode, and reduction always takes place at the cathode. And if you have trouble remembering that, there are a couple ways to remember. Sometimes we say red cat and an ox. So that's a nice little fun mnemonic aid to help us remember this. Red cat, you know, re reduction cathode, and an ox anode oxidation. Or if that's too corny for you, which it might be, then you can also remember that oxidation and anode both start with vowels, while, while reduction and cathode both start with consonants. So that's another way to remember how this works. Now, let's focus on the salt bridge here for a moment. So if we take a look at the reaction here, if we focus on the anode, we just said that there is oxidation taking place at the anode. And so that means that the iron atoms in this anode are actually being dissolved, or I, I guess we could say turned into iron to ions when those electrons are lost. And so that means that the iron anode over here is slowly being corroded away. And so if you were to look at this after a while, you might see like it's starting to dissolve away. You know, maybe it's being corroded. And so it's going to lose mass. That's what happens to the anode over time. It loses mass. Guess what? The anode is also becoming more positive. It's going from a charge of zero to a charge of plus two. And we know that, you know, if you have something becoming more positive, 
we have to account for that somehow. We have to counteract that. So since this side is becoming more positive, we need to get some negative charges in there to counteract that so that we don't electrocute ourselves. So this salt bridge here has both positive ions and negative ions. Well, guess what? The negative ions are going to gravitate toward the anode to counteract the fact that otherwise it would be turning into something that's more positive. Now the other, th the, the converse takes place at the cathode. We can see that the copper, you know, starts out as, as a positive two charge over here and it gains some electrons and it ends up as a zero charge. So we can say that the cathode, all things being equal, is becoming more negative. And we need to get some positive charges in there to counteract that so we don't electrocute ourselves on that side. So we're going to get these positive charges that are going to gravitate toward the cathode. And so that's what happens in the salt bridge. And so as we can see here, the copper is being formed. So if we're going to look at this over time, the copper cathode is going to be getting larger. It's going to be increasing in mass. And so if you have trouble remembering that, you can just remember that the cat gets fat. Or in other words, the cathode is increasing in mass. The cat gets fat. And so the cathode will increase in mass while the anode is going to generally decrease in mass. And so as we look at the salt bridge, we saw that the anions, you know, the, sulf the sulfate here is an anion, anions travel through the salt bridge toward the anode. And likewise, the cations will travel toward the cathode. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. You know, anions and anode, same prefix there. Well, the cations will go through the salt bridge to the cathode. And just so you know, the ions in the salt bridge should be inert. What that means is you want something in the salt bridge that's not going to react with what's already in there. So, you know, uh, in this case, we have iron ions over here on this side. I would not put something in that salt bridge that's going to react with iron ions like, oh, I don't know, um, carbonate ions. You know, those are fairly insoluble. So you would not want to put carbonate ions in there. Otherwise, you'll have some kind of a kind of a, a, a precipitate formed over here, and that's going to make a mess. So just practically speaking, you want ions in the salt bridge that are inert. Uh, sodium is a good choice. Uh, chloride, sulfate, most of the time is, is a pretty good choice as well. Now, let's review what we've learned about galvanic cells. There's a lot going on here. Reduction takes place at the cathode. That's just how it is. We were, uh, red cat and an ox, while oxidation takes place at the anode. And we talked about a couple ways to, re uh, to remember that. Electrons travel through the wire from the anode to the cathode. If you have trouble, uh, if you have trouble remembering that, think of AC, like the air conditioning. So if this side on the left was the, uh, the anode, then the electrons are traveling in this direction toward the cathode. They always go from anode to cathode. So that's a way to remember that. The cathode increases in mass. So if this is the cathode, that means that that copper piece over there is going to start to increase in mass. The cat gets fat. From the salt bridge, anions travel toward the anode and cations travel toward the cathode. So that's usually pretty easy to Oh, remember, and of course we have to throw some thermodynamics in here. Galvanic cells are always thermodynamically favored. You don't have to really do anything special to a battery to make it run. You just put it in the, the device and it goes, you know. So uh, thermodynamic favorability is always going to be uh, working here for galvanic cells. Well, if you learned something from this video, if you'd be so kind as to hit that like button, I'd really appreciate it. That way YouTube recommends my videos to other chemistry students. I've been teaching AP Chemistry for multiple decades, and I want you to get a five on your exam and make an A in your class. I'm, been, uh, I'm Jeremy Krug. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again where we can learn some more chemistry together.